This podcast is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Anchor is totally free and has everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Anchor has the tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. When hosting on Anchor, you can distribute your podcast on listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. So download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. That's anchor.fm to get started. Thank you. Welcome to Season 1 of The Devil Came Knocking, and thank you for taking the time to listen. In today's episode, we will begin to explore the Lily Lid murders. We will start by taking a look at the 10 lives that would intersect in such a tragic way at a rest stop in East Tennessee in 1997. I decided to start with this case as I grew up about 30 minutes from where these murders took place. I was 11 at the time and can vividly remember the news stories. If you go to my Twitter or TikTok, both you can find by searching The Devil Came Knocking. I have put up videos and pictures of the area where the crimes took place. The more research I did for this episode, the more questions I had. You begin to wonder, how much is the truth and how much is fabricated either to sell newspapers or by troubled teens not sure how to cope with what they had done. There were times I thought some if not all of these kids were just born evil. Yet others where I began to understand this was a long series of events that came to a truly tragic end. As we go through this story the next few weeks, I would love to hear what you think. Reach out to me on Twitter or TikTok. I would love to hear your thoughts on the case or the podcast itself. Warning to listeners, this podcast will contain graphic content and viewer discretion is advised. We will start our examination of this case by getting to know the Lily Lid family. The Lily Lids were a family of four, Vidar, age 34, and his wife, Delfina, age 28. They had two children, a six-year-old daughter, Tabitha, and a two-year-old son named Peter. Vidar grew up in Norway. He would immigrate to Miami in 1985. Delfina was a first-generation Honduran American, and she was from New Jersey. The two would meet in Miami at a Jehovah Witness convention and begin dating. Soon after, they would be married in 1989. Their religion would play a very important role in the family's life, and with hindsight being 2020, knowing how the story ends, it's interesting this is also the way it began. The couple's first child, Tabitha, was born in 1991. Shortly after, fed up with the drugs and violence in Miami, Vidar moved his family to Knoxville, Tennessee, a decision he made after visiting the area to hike in the Great Smoky Mountains. The family was looking for a quiet, safe place to raise their family. Vidar got a job at the Holiday Inn in Cedar Bluff in West Knoxville. He worked there as a bellman. Peter, the Lily Lid's son, was born in 1995. Delfina would be a stay-at-home mom, taking care of the children and homeschooling Tabitha. So the family's finances were pretty tight. Just six months prior to the killings, the family moved out of the apartments they had always lived in, moving into their first family home, a house in Powell, Tennessee. Vidar was able to buy Tabitha and Peter a swing set to put in the backyard. They had also planned to remodel the upstairs into an apartment for Delfina's mother. In May of 1997, the family had a trip to Norway planned to see Vidar's family. Sadly, this is a trip they would never make. All these factors, the move to Tennessee, the family's religion, and their financial status would lead them to an encounter with a troubled group of teens from Kentucky. What happened next would shock the nation 
and leave so many unanswered questions. Next, we will begin to take a look at the Pikeville Six, and then we will move into the case. The Pikeville Six. The Pikeville Six were a group of teenagers from Pikeville, Kentucky. Pikeville is a small town that as of the 2020 census had a population of 7,754. The group consisted of three boys, Dean Mullins, Joe Reisner, and Jason Bryant. There were also three girls, Natasha Cornett, Karen Howe, and Crystal Sturgill. All six members of the group were troubled, most struggled academically, and with substance abuse as well. All of the members except Jason Bryant had attended Betsy Lane High School. The group's ages ranged from 14 to 20, and most had went through some sort of abuse or trauma during their early lives. Today we will take a look at each member of the group, and I will try to better explain their backstory. I think this is important in trying to understand how a crime like this could possibly be committed by six teenagers. As we lay out the facts to this case, Ask yourself, was this the beginning of a cross-country murder spree, similar to the movie Natural Born Killers, apparently Natasha's favorite movie? As the DEA suggests, did the Lily Lids simply run into evil that day, or was this simply a crime of opportunity committed by troubled teens trying to escape a lifetime of, ab of abuse and bullying? When a crime this brutal happens, we always want answers. The frustrating thing about this case, however, there may be none. And the most important ones are locked inside six people who all tell a slightly different story. Let's get to know them a little better so next week we can begin to look at the terrible crimes they committed. Natasha Cornett. We will begin our investigation into the Pikeville Six by looking at Natasha's life. It seems Natasha was the informal leader of the group. All of the group seems to be tied together by her and spent most of their time at Natasha's mother's house. She would be born Natasha Wallen on January 26, 1979 in Betsy Lane, Kentucky. Her father was Roger Burgess, a local policeman. Her mother, Madonna Wallen, was married to a man named Ed Wallen. Madonna had gotten pregnant with Natasha as a result of an affair. Madonna would leave Ed when Natasha was just a toddler. She would raise Natasha in poverty on the outskirts of Pikeville, Kentucky. Ed would stay in Natasha's life until a DNA test exposed Madonna's affair, at which time she cut him out of Natasha's life. Madonna was physically abusive to Natasha. Some of Natasha's friends reported seeing Madonna strike Natasha with everything from plastic bats to Bibles. Madonna admitted to hitting Natasha but said never with her fists. Madonna also admitted to striking Natasha with the belt buckle of a belt, leaving bruises. Despite all the trouble and turmoil in her life at home, Natasha excelled academically and was known to be very polite. The start of a down the downward spiral in Natasha's life seems to be centered around one event that occurred when she was in just the fifth grade. Her mom attempted suicide, and unfortunately, Natasha would be the one to find her passed out naked after taking prescription drugs. Here is an interview of her mother discussing it, as well as Natasha testifying in court about it. She went through an ordeal of mine. She had tried to kill herself. I remember taking six pills, six sleeping pills. I went in there to a bedroom and I found them laying in the bed with no clothes on. I took a whole bottle. I don't remember it. And I tried to wake her up. And she found where I had got sick. And she wouldn't wake up. I started getting scared. She didn't know what was going on. I didn't want to wake her up because I knew she'd yell at me. So, I uh, like sat curled up next to her door. She laid down in the floor at the door of the bedroom. And I'm Yeah. This event caused a drastic turn in Natasha. By the seventh grade, she developed anorexia, dropping 30 pounds in just one month. It would also be around this time she would begin to self-harm by cutting. 
On the advice of doctors, it was around this time Madonna would have her admitted to Charter Ridge Hospital in Lexington. Here is another clip of Natasha testifying in court about her mental health diagnosis. What was your understanding that, that the doctor said was wrong with you? Uh, they told me I was bipolar. Uh, they told you that? Yeah, they told me that I was bipolar. That's all I said. Okay, did they explain that to you at all? Uh-uh. Did they uh, uh, tell you what to, to do to stop that? Do you need any medication? The doctors at the hospital would diagnose Natasha as both manic depressive and bipolar. Doctors would also label her a danger to herself and others. However, after just 11 days at the facility, Natasha was forced to leave as Medicaid would not pay for further treatment. Madonna was advised to seek professional help but could not afford to. Here is Madonna talking about it in her own words. They told me that said that she needed to stay longer, that she wasn't okay, that probably there would be, you know, worse things that would happen to her because she was still a troubled child. But, you know, I couldn't afford to keep her in the hospital, and uh, Medicaid wouldn't pay anymore. At 13, Natasha would be arrested for the first time when Madonna called the police after finding Natasha self-harming with a knife. When Madonna had tried to intervene, Natasha had threatened her with a knife, forcing Madonna to call the law. She would be arrested again at 14 for forgery and placed on one-year probation. Once Natasha entered high school, she was no longer the sweet, preppy, good student she once was. She was experimenting heavily with drugs and alcohol, and she had also adopted the goth look, something she would be severely bullied for by not just the students of the school, but the faculty as well. By 15, Natasha had quit school, and at 17, she would marry Stephen Cornett, a lifelong friend. The marriage only lasted about six months, and the ending of the marriage caused a severe decline in Natasha's mental health. Natasha then moved to New Orleans with a friend, trying to escape the life she had lived in Kentucky. While in New Orleans, however, Natasha would be beaten and gang raped by five men, adding to the trauma the young girl already carried. She would soon move back to Kentucky where she would find comfort in an old friend, Karen Howe. Karen Howe Karen was born on September the 25th, 1979 in Delaware, Ohio. Her father was an abusive alcoholic, and her mother had severe mental health issues, described by Karen at the trial as nervous breakdowns. The family would move to Kentucky when Karen was three. Karen's home life was full of abuse and trauma. She would watch her parents fight violently until they divorced when she was nine. She was also sexually abused by an uncle and a cousin from the age of five till the age of ten. Karen had an IQ of just 78 and would fall on the scale of borderline retarded. Karen also suffered from obvious mental health issues as she claimed to hear voices and have hallucinations. She also claimed to have the ability to automatic write, a claim psychic ability to produce written words without consciously writing. I have a couple clips of Karen testifying at the trial about hearing of voices and her hallucinations. You can hear those now. Let's talk about your relationship with Natasha Cornett. You and she both heard voices, didn't you? Yes. Male voices. Male and female. Let's talk about those hallucinations for a moment. Okay. Starting with snakes. Yes. And then spirits. Snakes and spirits and demons. And then balls of light bouncing off of the wall. Like, yeah, just little balls of light. As Karen began to get older, she would show an interest in witchcraft, sometimes using a Ouija board with Natasha. 
She also had begun to use drugs, particularly LSD. By the age of 13, she had begun to self-mutilate. It seems like Karen's life was beginning to spiral out of control. Karen's mother was extremely religious and actually believed Karen was possessed. She would bring ministers into the home to try to cast out the demons. She even went as far as to rub holy oil on Karen's doorknobs and would make Karen stand on a Bible for punishment. She would continue to live with her mother until she was 14, but the two fought often. Karen would meet Natasha and Joseph in high school. Karen would also drop out, but would continue to earn her GED. She was a troubled child diagnosed bipolar and repeatedly abused and traumatized. She attempted suicide four times, twice by cutting her wrists and twice by overdose. Natasha and Karen were best friends. We will look into their relationship more later. Crystal Renee Sturgill. The last girl in the group was Crystal Sturgill, born March 13, 1979 in Harold, Kentucky. She would be emotionally neglected and repeatedly abused at home. Her mother, Teen Blackburn, refused to name her father. Crystal was an above average student when she was young, although in high school her grades had somewhat slipped. She would blame this on experimenting with drugs and alcohol, a fact that would be supported by her scores on standardized tests. She had scored a 28 on the ACT. Crystal was a senior at Betsy Lane and also attended Floyd County Technical School. She also worked in a co-op program with the local elementary school daycare, where by all reports she did well and the leaders of the program considered her to be capable of handling the children. Crystal accused her stepfather of sexual abuse in December of 96. He would admit the abuse started when she was just four years old, and at 13 he would begin raping her. He would be convicted later, and despite his confession, members of Crystal's family, including her mother, did not believe Crystal. She would kick Crystal out of her house, and over the next few months leading up to the crime in April, she would live in 13 different places. The last place she would stay would be with Natasha. This is the backstory of the three girls. All led similar lives, and I think this is one of the things that drew them together. There were many opportunities for someone to step in and help possibly prevent what was to come. Edward Dean Mullins. Dean Mullins was born in Harold, Kentucky in 1978. Dean had by all accounts a fairly normal home life. His father worked for a heating and air conditioning company and his mother worked as a receptionist for a law office in Pikeville. Dean attended church regularly before meeting the other members of the group. He quit high school during his senior year in 1996 but was working to obtain his GED. He had worked for a local grocery store in 1993 and 94. Dean himself described his home life as normal and good, with family saying he was quite an insecure kid. Dean would begin dating Natasha Cornett, who he said he planned to marry. Dean was also close friends with Crystal, and he would be the one to introduce her to the group. Although it's reported she objected to his relationship with Cornette. Both Crystal and Dean had no prior criminal record before 1997. Next, we will take a look at Jason Bryant. Jason Bryant. Jason was the youngest of the Pottville Six and was born July 18, 1982 in Heller, Kentucky. He would be abandoned by his mother as a toddler and would live with his alcoholic father who often neglected Jason. Jason was in eighth grade at Millard School. He had an IQ of just 85 and was said to have the emotional and social skills of an 11-year-old. Jason also had a history of substance abuse, and that was rumored to have started as early as the age of three. There are conflicting stories about Jason's background. He was in psychological counseling for his behavior at school 
And the most consistent stories are that Jason was a troubled, unpredictable, and sometimes violent teen. Madonna, Natasha's mom, claimed she was always scared of Jason. Honestly, though, I don't know if you can trust anything she says. Here is a clip of Jason testifying in court. You're going to counseling because of your school behavior, is that correct? Um, basically, yes. You know what counseling means? Psychological counseling. Helping you out mentally. Uh, yeah. Joseph Lance Reisner. Joe Reisner was born on October the 13th of 1976 in Hazard, Kentucky. He never met his biological father and took the last name of his stepfather. Joe's decline seems to begin after him and his mother are forced to move back to Kentucky from Georgia after his mother and stepfather divorced, a divorce that seems to be caused by the stepfather's drug use. Here is a clip of Joe's mother testifying about Joe's father and of Joe's stepfather testifying about his drug use. You're Joe's mother. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you uh, first whether or not Joe has ever laid eyes on his real father. No, sir. Uh, and that was because you left his real father yes, uh, when I guess you were, what, two months pregnant? Yes, sir. It's not a fact that I'm very proud of, but... When money started rolling in, um, in order to, the way I rationalized it, in order to keep up with the grind, I started dabbling in methamphetamines. It got worse and it kept getting worse and it kept getting worse. The more money I made, the more I did. Joe was a good student until the divorce. However, after the divorce, he declined academically and would fail the seventh and the eighth grade. It was also around this time he began to experiment with drugs, mainly marijuana and LSD. He would later testify that he was just 10 years old the first time he tried drugs. At 12, he claimed he was sexually abused by two babysitters. Here is Joe testifying about his drug use, as well as a bizarre moment in the trial when his mom was asked about his drug use. Well, certain things were. How old were you the first time you ever tried any drugs? And what drugs were you? Yeah, I, just, I think I was 10, and it was like marijuana. And did he do that in your home? Yes, he did, with me. And tell us about that. I wanted him to, I wanted to find out how he was going to react to it when he did smoke it. I wanted to be with him because, you know, some people it doesn't bother. Some people get paranoid. Some people have all different kinds of things with it. And I wanted to know how he'd react. Joe would meet Karen Howe in high school, and the two would begin to date. He would drop out of school and join the Army in 1995, but would be discharged for failing a drug test shortly after. He earned his GED in May of 96 and had been accepted into Mayo Regional Technology Center. There are rumors that Joe was very feminine, and some friends say the girls of the group would put makeup on him and put him in dresses. He was also said to be jealous of Natasha and Karen's relationship. That concludes this week's episode and our look into the Lily Lid family and the Pikeville Six. I thought it was important to get a better understanding of each individual person involved in this story. Next week, we will dive into the group as a whole, the days leading up to the crime, and the events at the Collie Motel. Thank you for taking the time to listen, and I hope you enjoyed our very first episode. Please come back next week for our second episode, and if you are interested in hearing the rest of the story, please follow the podcast and turn on the notifications. Thank you.